Good morning. Well, this morning I am putting on gloves. Now there is a reason why I'm putting on gloves, and that is because today we are going to talk a little bit about amphibians. Now, in Illinois, the state where I live, we have 20 different species of amphibians that live here. Now, many of you have probably ever, never even seen a salamander before. And salamanders and all amphibians, they have smooth, wet skin and they are able to get a lot of environmental factors through their skin that can be very irritating or very harmful to them. So that is why they're one of the big indicators as to how our environment is doing because they're gonna be one of the first affected by things that are in our environment. So I'm wearing the gloves because lately we've been doing so much hand washing and putting so many chemicals on our hands to kill the germs that I don't wanna pick up one of my salamanders and have um, adverse effects to them. So that's why I am wearing gloves today. Not because they could get me sick, but because I wanna make sure that they st stay very healthy. So you've seen a couple of the toads that I have, and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about salamanders, because they are one of the ones that we really don't find that often. We might see the toads in our, in our garden, but salamanders, you have to really go and look for them. And there's a phrase in herpetology called flipping tin. And when people are looking for snakes, a lot of times they put this big sheet of tin out in their pasture or in, the, in some area where they're doing research and they let it sit there for a long time. And then they use these kind of like big hooks to flip the tin back over to see if anything has made a home underneath of that. And a lot of times you'll find snakes. So when you're looking for things like salamanders, you flip rocks and logs. So if you're out in the woods somewhere and you're kind of close to a stream, some of them will be in a stream where you can flip over some of the big flat rocks and you might find them under there. And then some are a little bit more terrestrial where they're gonna be a little bit further away from the stream but still close enough where when it's time to lay the eggs then they would be able to have easy access to the stream. Because remember amphibians, they start out as an egg and that egg is not like a chicken egg at all. It's like a little, little jelly bead or it almost looks like the little tapioca beads so they're little tiny jelly beads and so they need a lot of moisture so they go into the water source to to lay their eggs a lot of them like what's called ephemeral ponds ephemeral means that it's going to be there for a little bit but then it's going to disappear and the reason why they like those ephemeral ponds is because there's not going to be a lot of other animal species living in that pond like fish that could eat their eggs. So they lay those eggs there. Uh, you know, the frogs and toads become tadpoles. And you'll have that same kind of process for some of the salamanders as well. Um, one of the cool terms though is like when you have a juvenile salamander, it's called an eft, E-F-T. And it, it's just this kind of cute little thing. So the first salamander that I'm gonna show you is my tiger salamander. So hang on a second while I catch it. Okay. And this is my tiger salamander. And its name is Tigger. Now you can see it has tiny eyes. So do you think that if it has such tiny eyes that that's gonna be one of the main senses that it uses? I remember a lot of these guys kind of come out at nighttime. So they're not gonna be the best eyesight in the world there. But you can see it has, see it's kind of slimy. It has smooth, wet skin and it just peed on me, yay! That's part of the joys of having animals. Now, why do you think it would have peed on me? Why do you think? Some of you guys have had toads and you pick up toads and they pee. It's kind of a self-defense thing. I know I wouldn't want to have a mouth full of uh, toad pee or salamander pee, would you? Yeah, so this is Tigger, the tiger salamander. 
Don't they always look like they're smiling? Yeah, you're up to something, aren't you? But this is quite large. A lot of the species that we have here in Illinois are just a few inches long. They're little teeny tiny ones. Remember I said that their skin is very sensitive? There is a place by us that some researchers, they found that the little blue and black salamanders that we have around here, um, they were crossing a parking lot in a forest preserve to get to the lake and the parking lot in wintertime had been salted and it was killing all of the salamanders as they were trying to go across. So there's people that were rescuing them, picking them up, taking them across that. But once the forest preserve was alerted that that was happening, they no longer salt that parking lot. But it was just kind of a matter of citizen scientists that were alerting the people that were in charge that that was happening. And once they did that, they solved that problem. So you can see right here, this one right here is an adult. And when salamanders first hatch out and they're little and they're in the water, they have external gills to be able to get the air supply. Now they don't breathe water, but water has got oxygen in it. And that is what those gills do. They're kind of like an oxygen magnet and they're able to pull that oxygen out of the water so that they're able to breathe. But then as they grow, their lungs develop and their gills slowly start to recede and eventually will disappear and they will depend upon lungs to breathe. But I'm gonna show you another one that's even more interesting and it has helped. Hey Carolyn, how are you? I see ya. Hi Anna Marie. So I'm gonna put Tigger back. Hey Tigger, give Tigger a kiss. Now, Tigger will eat things like, I give it a lot of crickets, and I can give it some worms and things like that for it to eat. Now, I'm gonna brush off these gloves real quick. Got a lot of soil on them, substrate. So now I'm gonna show you something called an axolotl. And you go, what is that? Now, for people when they're like, they'll look at the word, and they go, how do you pronounce it? Because it's A-X-O-L-O-T-L. -O -O and it's just really kind of odd. So I always tell people, I love my Axie, not a little, but a lot. -le. So you're gonna see this now. I've taken it out of its normal tank. It usually is a 20 gallon long. And it's just easier for me to get it out of this. So I'm going to show you first. This is the little tank that I put it in right here. Okay, but I can take it out for a couple of seconds here, so I will do that. They are very slippery because they're always in the water. Okay, so here is the axolotl. You see how slimy it is? All right, now this is a girl, but you can see those red things right there, those are the gills. And you see again, it has those really teeny tiny eyes, so it's not going to depend upon that really as one of its major senses. So I'm gonna put the axolotl back in the water because that's where it belongs. And I do have another one that is behind me here. So I'm gonna see if I can you can just see it peeking right here behind this rock right there. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the axolotls and why they are so important and how that they have helped us. One of the things I like to talk about is a subject called biomimicry. Now, for those of you who are a little bit older and you remember taking biology classes, bio means life, ology means the study of, so biomimicry, bio life mimicry to copy. So it is looking to nature for inspiration to create technologies in a more sustainable way, copying what nature has already done. So the axolotl is almost all stem cells. Now stem cells are what you and I were made of at the beginning. So before we were born, 
all of our cells are some stem cells and one is like hey I'll become the ear another one I'll become the eye and so they can all become something and that's why they're important to us um, because now as we get older we might have knees that are failing us and sometimes they do something called stem cell therapy where we take our own adult stem cells because we still have a few of them not a whole lot but we have some enough and they can take that and they can put it into our knee and they'll go hey i'm supposed to be a knee and so it's going to regenerate and be uh, help your knee out and the reason we know so much about stem cells and how they work is partly because of the axolotl because they were originally uh, taken from the wild they were from the areas around mexico city um, there are some lakes that were up in the mountains and they were cooler and calm they like cool still water um, my tanks you can see they do not have any waterfalls or bubblers or filters or gravel because they'll sometimes eat it um, so i do a complete water change every week i take it out put all fresh water in treat it and put them back in there so they're kind of easy to take care of but so they were brought in to study because of the stem cells now in the wild they are for all intents and purposes extinct i think the last count i heard there was maybe 13 of them left in the wild and part of that is because the area where they live there's more pollution there's boat traffic and the temperature of the water is increasing to where they wouldn't be able to survive in the wild there anymore. Um, and which is amazing because these guys have such regenerative properties. They can lose their tail and regrow it. They can lose a leg and regrow it. I even saw one that had five legs because it had an injury on its elbow and another leg grew out of it. It, it was just amazing. They can get a bite to their abdomen, lose part of their internal organs, and they can regrow. They can get a bite to the head and lose part of their brain and regrow it. So the, it's just amazing. But they need cool, still water. So in the wild, virtually extinct. Um, but in captivity, they breed prolifically. Um, they will always have them, but we won't necessarily be able to return them to the wild until their habitat is restored, which could be very difficult. You can have them in just about every state except for a couple. I know California is one where you can't have them because there's a species that's just close enough to these guys that they would, if they were released, like someone had them a pet and decided they didn't want them anymore and just dumped them um, into the waters, that they could possibly mate with the wild ones and then they would create hybrids, which then you would lose that specific species. And so they, they are pretty cool, but it was because of us observing and understanding how the stem cells work in axolotls that we have a better understanding of how they work in us and how we can use them to, you know, inspire us to be able to treat using stem cells today. So they're, they're pretty awesome. Um, as, as a pet, they're very easy. Uh, they do respond to you. I know in the evening when I go to feed them, they're always like waiting and looking up, waiting for the food to drop, and then they suck it in really, really super fast. Um, I don't know if I would be able to show you that. I might be able to. Let me see if I can get a piece of food and move the camera here. I am going to move things just a tiny bit here and move that up. Let me see if I can put this up here. I'm going to aim it down a bit so we can see. Now this one's name is Shishimi. And we'll see if Shishimi will eat for you. Oh, that was just a little one. Just a little. The funny thing is, is as Shishimi has gotten older, she tends to eat a little bit slower. So she used to be really super fast at sucking those in. 
but now she slows down a little bit. Hi, Anna. So this is the axolotl. Remember, A-X-O-L-O-T-L. -O -O it's kind of a funny word. Now, a long time ago, people used to call them Mexican walking fish but it's not a fish at all. So it's really what we call a misnomer. It's not, not right. But you can see how those gills are working. They move back and forth. And they're all, so they're just pulling the air out of the water. Isn't that cool? I can tell this is a female because she's really girthy. She's got, she's got some heft to her. Whereas my male chowder, is a little bit skinnier and a little bit, he's a lot younger right now so but i hope you enjoyed the axolotl um, in the future i do have a book a children's book about an axolotl so we'll probably read that right now my tilly my tortoise is about ready to trip over the wire so i think we'll end it here oh they're un unhooked hang on one more foot over there you can do it tilly pick that foot up and we did it, we cleared it. Let me see if we can see what Tilly's doing over here. See, there's Tilly just cruising. Hey, Tilly. Uh, Tilly got her, uh, her breakfast, and then she does a little bit of going around. So I hope all of you guys are doing well, and that if your weather is good by you, you will be able to go out inside and do a little stuff. Now, I just realized yesterday that I do get Wi-Fi in the backyard. So from time to time, I might do a live broadcast from out in the backyard so you can see some of the things that are out there. So I wanna thank you guys for stopping by. Remember, if you want alerts that I'm going live, you just have to like my page and do the follow first and it will give you the updates and when I am doing this. But even if I am out in the backyard, I will, uh, if I have to do a video, I'll still post it. I know I have a video that I wanna post for you that I was able to take over at the Morton Arboretum before they closed and that was of the chorus frogs. It's one of my favorite sounds of spring. So I wanna thank you guys again. Remember to like, share, and we'll see you guys Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Bye-bye.